Hello and welcome to CGS with me, Paul Harris. Today, I'm joined by Sarah armstrong Montoya, who is President and CEO of Cordoba Minerals, who's going to talk to us about their recent feasibility study on the Alacran project in Cordoba in Colombia. Sarah, good morning. Good morning, Paul. Thank you for having me. And I should also add Happy New Year. Um, a great way to end. Uh, you had a, a very good end to 2023, a newborn and a feasibility study. Wow. Thank you, Paul. Yes, we certainly did. Uh, it was it was a lot of a lot of effort, but I'm, I'm I have a great team, and and we were able to get the the ability study over the line prior to the year end uh, and the filing of our EIA, uh, which was no more no small feat either. Well, let's take those one at a time, and let's start with the feasibility study. Some of the numbers uh, from there: uh, four hundred twenty million dollars uh, US capex, internal rate of return post tax twenty three point eight percent, seventeen thousand six hundred ton per day operation for fourteen point uh, two years. Um, how happy were that? Was very similar to the pre feasibility study, which yeah. I believe came out in two thousand and twenty two. So you, you kept things pretty similar. Um, I imagine you were quite pleased with that. Yeah, very pleased, Paul. I mean, as you know, during these processes, the numbers actually often go down quite dramatically between the PEA and then the PFS and then the, the feasibility study. So we were pretty pleased with that. We were able to do some more um, optimization and some through studies um, in this feasibility study, which is, as you mentioned there, we're now got a 17,600 per day, um, ton per day production that was previously 22,000 tonnes per day, but uh, it seems that this this project is a much better candidate at 17,600 uh, tonnes per day. Um, that seems to be the sweet spot there. So that does give us a 14.2 year life of mine. And that's uh, in addition to two years of construction um, and a year of closing. And I think importantly there, we still do have um, our satellite pits, which can be brought into this into this project, which it would extend on the, the life of mine by another another three years. So I think that's an important thing to highlight. The the feasibility was on Alacran. You've got a number of other sort of targets or, or deposits shaping up in the in the district as well. Absolutely. Part of, part of the transaction that we did with JCHX, our, our Chinese strategic partner, um, on the Alacran project included five titles. Um, and so the idea for us here is to continue simultaneously exploring and developing those other titles as well. The PTO and the 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 feasibility study were specifically on, and 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 the EIA, sorry, were all specifically on the Alacran title. So there is more room here for for further growth and development. Okay, let's bring in the EIA and the sort of permitting process. Um, a key part of that, you, I know you've focused a lot on water, the water aspects, acid drainage, uh, neutralization of that. And indeed, uh, one of the, the experts you used on that presented at the CGS conference here in Medellin in, in November, talking specifically about the, the amount of work you've done there. So talk to us about the EIA and what the permitting steps are for you. Sure. The EIA was was a monumental task, uh, I have to say, over the last few years, and we did that simultaneously with the feasibility study. So the results from our feasibility study supported uh, the EIA, and then we had additional studies that needed to be done there. Um, as you just mentioned, Patrick gave a great speech um, recently on on all of the work that we've done, and in, in, in specifically with water, which is a main focus for, for ANLA. Uh, we've been extremely fortunate to have ongoing round tables with with um, the technical team at ANLA so that we could familiarise them with our project ahead of filing um, the EIA. And this is particularly important in our case because we're using a um, thick and tailings and commingling of waste rock, which is the first time that's been used here in Colombia. And so it was very important for us to be able to uh, go through that 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 with them uh, rather than the conventional tales so that when we file the EIA we're not all here with with something new and something that's that's not necessarily understood um so we filed the EIA on the 12th of December um we've already had um an initial meeting with with Anna following the filing of the EIA we've had tremendous support from them um and I would hope and 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 I'm optimistic given given the relationship that we have with them and the amount of work that's gone into this and the the ongoing round tables that we would have the the EIA approved uh this year in 2024. 
Okay, just want to add in there the the, Pat, the presentation you mentioned there was by Patrick Williamson of Interra. That is on the the cgsorg.com website uh, for people that are interested in finding out more about that. So, if the EIA does get approved later this year, what are the next steps for the for the company? Well, in actual fact, uh, next week I'm heading to China. Uh, we're having meetings around the detailed engineering uh, design phase of the of the project, so we're moving straight into that. And, uh, and kicking off with detailed detailed engineering design. Um, that should take us through to about the end of the year and around the same time as the licensing of the project. Throughout that time, we will continue on with our social and, and, and community work, um, in particular with the community of Al Alacran. Um, I've mentioned to you before that that as part of the, the process and the project, given they are, they are on top of the, the pit, they will need to be relocated. Uh, and so the idea is to continue uh, and, and reach agreements with them prior to the, the environmental license being approved, so that when that is approved, um, we can move straight into that, that relocation and start construction where we're able to start construction. Okay. With the completion of the feasibility and the filing of the EIA, that uh, triggered um, a 40 million US dollar payment by JCHX to Cordova Minerals, and that was completed uh, just last week. Um, will right. that fund anything specifically, or is that just uh, cash for ongoing operations to get you through to the, the, the permitted project? No, that will fund the detailed engineering design uh, phase of the project, Paul, and we may have to put down some deposits on on heavy machinery. We're, we're not sure on that yet. That's part of the meetings that will be next week, but it's really to take us through until the construction phase of the project. Okay, it seems to be um, a really good time to be getting into this position on the cusp of being able to develop a project. The copper's hovering just under $4 per pound. Uh, there's a, a deficit forecast for this year following the uh, the closure of Kobe Panama and a couple of other things in the market. What, what's your sense of the market and how it's going to evolve over the next couple of years as you get towards that construction decision? I'm bullish on copper. Um, <laughs> I think we're all aware that there's a huge uh, lag between supply and demand, and that's only going to get worse. And 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 so I think that we're in a quite a sweet spot here. Um, with, with the Alacran project and that being 70% copper. But I think we're going to see an increase in, in copper prices in the next few years. Okay. And as you advance the project, uh, I imagine your thoughts are increasingly turning towards financing. You mentioned you've got a 50% joint venture partner in JCHX. So presumably they'll be providing half of the funds and uh, it'll be for Cordoba potentially to provide the other half of the funds. What, what's your think, thoughts there about how and what kind of financing you put together? Actually, that we would we would uh, fund through the joint venture company, Paul. So it would be it would be the actual joint venture company that does the financing, not necessarily a a fifty fifty. And these economics for the for the feasibility study were done on a hundred percent equity basis, and we have run the numbers. Uh, and this project can also support debt and and quite an amount thereof. And so I've actually already started this process as well. It's an interesting question. We're currently looking at. What is the best structure to finance this this project? And is it a combination of equity and debt? How much debt? What what amount of debt can it support? I mean, I'm I am aware that debt is expensive right now, but this project can support um, can support debt. And perhaps there are a combination of of royalties and 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 a royalty and 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 of streaming. Um, so we're undergoing that analysis at the moment, but it will be the joint venture company that goes out to fund rather than um, the fifty fifty partnership. I imagine. Okay, given some of the uh, environmental benefits you've uh, programmed in into the uh, the feasibility in the EIA, to what extent or not do you think you you may be able to get sort of sustainability loans, uh, green financing, those kind of things? Because in addition to the water performance that you touched on, um, um, Colombia's basically got a hydroelectric powered grid, which I imagine you'll be able to tap into as well. So the copper you produce will have a very low carbon content related to it. That's something else that we're evaluating at the moment. I mean, one of the things that you that that I guess um, in addition to what you've just mentioned now is where we are cleaning up the historical tailings dam um, and all the previous environmental damage in the area. So um, I think I think we're in a good position to be able to to, to seek um, different types of financing and look at, to the likes of World Bank um, and some other large organisations. But again, that process is just starting now, and we expect to be running that throughout the course of this year. Okay. One final thing I wanted to ask you about, Sarah, which um, 
isn't directly related to, to your project. You're in Cordoba, you're not far away from South 32 Cerro Matoso um, nickel mine. In December, they had to... De- Pardon me? 20 kilometres. Oh, 20 kilometres. In, in yeah. December, they had to declare force majeure because community protests were, were blocking them. Um, now, that's obviously not directly related to Cordoba, but um, presumably there's something you, you, you're you watching that with interest and in how the communities are relating with Ceramatosa there. So what are your takeaways there? And what, what are things you can perhaps learn from what's their experience to help avoid a similar experience for Cordoba? Look, absolutely. I think we can all acknowledge that, that, you know, community issues and and, and working with the communities and, and living within the same area and, and, and having the communities are effectively, um, it's a partnership and they are our partners. Um, it's not always easy. And I think it's a big learning curve um, for, for both sides. Um, you know, a, the one thing I would say in, in this area where the project is, um, is it, it is a pro-mining area. I mean, because of Sarah Matosso, the local communities understand what mining is. They understand the benefits of that um, and and what comes along with it. And I think, you know, whilst it didn't have any impact on us, um, that 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 force majeure event, it's, it's very unfortunate for Sarah Matosso. We need to learn from that and we need to look at what what are what is affecting the community and 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 what their position is as as it, as the as the project develops so that we don't encounter um the same situation and i think that absolutely key to this is ensuring that there is a constant communication a constant dialogue and that we're listening to what the community say um i think in our case we have a mobile office so in addition to having a fixed office in puerto libertador we also have a mobile office that goes daily between the communities and that's something that we'll need to maintain um if not increase so that we're not only hearing from the community leaders but we're hearing from the actual community members because once you get to that situation of of the blocking um it's it's extremely complicated and it's and it's and it's really difficult. I mean, we've we've had those sort of situations ourselves in the past, and it's it's a long road to to surpass that and 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 to maintain that sort of good relationship with the community. So I think really, Paul, it comes down to sort of listening to the community, understanding what they're wanting to do, and understanding what what um, their concerns are, um, and addressing those, but always um, within reason. Um, you know, as long as there's sort of reasonable requests. Um, I think it's something that we need to learn to work with, given that they are partners in the project. Okay. And finally, Sarah, to close, what are your key goals for this year for the company and for the project? I'd like to be starting construction at the end of 2024. Um, So getting through the detailed engineering design, um, reaching agreements with with the communities, with with the Alacran community in particular that we need to relocate. Um, So I'd like to have that that lined up and I'd like to be starting construction by the end of uh, 2024. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that, Sarah, and hopefully we'll be able to have another conversation a bit later in the year to see how that's progressing. Thank you very much, Paul. Have a nice day. And Cordon Minerals trades on the TSXV under CDB and on the OTCQB under CDBMF. Sarah Armstrong Matoya, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. That's all from me, Paul Harris. Stay tuned for more from CGS.